Well, welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you that were here last night, welcome back. And for those of you who were not here last night, welcome. Uh, we are at the second of our uh, uh, public events for the Plastic Awareness Global Initiative Ocean Sciences Meeting. This meeting is set up of a, a set of international scientists who are here trying to learn about the status, trends, and maybe some potential solutions having to do with plastics in the ocean. We aren't going to get as far into the solutions as we'd hoped for, uh, because, or as we would hope for as individuals, uh, we're getting as far as we had planned for within this meeting. Plastics in the ocean, I think we can all agree, are something that are created by people and are, is a problem that we probably need to find a solution for. We need to do every solution by finding collaborations and looking in creative ways to link individuals together. The working group here is a group of experts that span physical, biological, chemical sciences. Uh, the audience here uh, represents a number of different disciplines. And at its root, the Plastic Awareness Global Initiative was founded uh, by the inspiration on the steering committee of Dr. Igor Kornichik. A music professor, <laughs> uh, an alumna, alumnus of uh, script or of UC San Diego, the music department, and uh, an avid ocean lover, also an experimental musician, who I, I had addressed and noticed a problem in the world and wanted to find a way to solve it. Igor has been an inspiration for us in terms of finding ways to not just do science the way we typically do science, but to try to think of a way at, to use our creativity in identifying the problem, trying to solve a problem, and to engage a broader community in this. I really am pleased, it's been an honor to work with Igor, it's been, a, it's been an honor and very fun to travel with Igor and Susan, uh, and to see some of these problems firsthand, and to really start fighting through, thinking through, designing ways that we can leverage the strength of us as a community and our different strengths. To introduce the panel tonight, Dr. Igor Kornichek. Mm. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, I'm really glad to see you all here today. Uh, so yes, I am uh, a founding member of the Wilsdorf Mettler Future Foundation, uh, which is co-sponsoring this event. And I am delighted uh, to once again introduce this now second public encounter of our four-day symposium that we're calling uh, PAGI, or Plastics Awareness Global Initiative, uh, discussing what to do with this amazing, indestructible material that we humans have created. Uh, I hope this is the beginning of a journey with Poggy, not a one-off event, uh, wherein this becomes a springboard for future discussions and actions uh, to combat the challenges that are presented by the discarding of plastic. Last night you heard a lot of the sort of issues that uh, uh, plastic poses for the health, not just of humans, but humans, of course, and the planet in general. I personally became interested in trying to imagine solutions when I came across a uh, an American-made plastic grocery bag, uh, masquerading as a large jellyfish in what should be pristine waters a couple of thousand miles on the Asian side of the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is the biggest of the five gyres of ja trash in our oceans. What does it mean for the planet if this keeps building up and never disappears? What, if anything, uh, can be done about the already existing plastic soup that coexists with an increasingly diminishing uh, number of ocean species? What will fix our human psyche so that nations across the globe will, for example, accept the need to better manage or even ban the convenience of something so unnecessary as a plastic shopping bag? The problem is at once both global and personal. That the nature of plastic is so light, chemically neutral, and benign is precisely the problem. It is not nutritious, and its half-life is exceedingly long. The stuff can be swallowed by whatever species that match its size, be it flip-flops by sharks, uh, bottle tops by birds. You've seen these pictures. 
particles of cigarette filters by anemones, and sympathetic molecules by microbes, causing starvation and strangulation all up and down the food chain. And we're on top of that food chain. Simply put, the planet is choking on plastic. Despite all human efforts so far to recycle, a study that came out in the National Geographic uh, in the summer of 2017 has indicated that 91% of all plastic has not been recycled and has simply been thrown away. And all the plastic that was ever produced since the first man-made polymer, synthetic polymer in the 1940s and the first appearance of plastic particles in the ocean in the 70s is still around. Of this 91%, much of which, if not most, found its way into the ocean, it is estimated that 90% of that is smaller than a quarter inch. That trash has been broken down over time and has become largely uncountable. Here at Scripps, we have a veritable library of warehoused vials of ocean water samples from as far back as the 70s. And Dr. Jennifer Brandon, who is with us today and uh, will moderate our panel discussion, has mobilized a crew of interns and students to actually count and attempt to identify the smallest microscopic particles of plastic found in these vials. From the tireless work of her and her team, it is possible to estimate that these amounts, but we know the scope of the plastic swamp only indirectly. If the planet can be saved from the menace of synthetic plastic, let alone save our species and most vertebrates from plastic, then the problem of plastic breaks down, as I see it, into three categories of solutions to be sought, each greater and more difficult to accomplish than the previous. One, cleaning up existing undesirable plastic. Two, elimination and prevention of further non-wanted plastic spilling into the environment. Three, and ultimately, functionally, replacing the use of plastic. Of course, as I think is clear, if mankind cannot solve this, then the problem facing the planet may be resolved of its own by the elimination of the species. But I'm still on Team Human, and I would like to think that <laughs> solutions may yet be found to resolve these three issues. Plastics must be removed from the ocean as thoroughly as possible. This is the cleanup of the ocean represented by optimistic efforts and expectations of the Dutch engineer Boyan Slat's ingenious nature-powered collector concept pursued by the Ocean Cleanup NGO that first led me to be interested in our ability to come up with creative solutions to this problem. As big as this problem is, it would seem to be the, just the first and easiest issue to address. It just takes dedicated people and machines to go get it. But we know the challenge is great. We hear more and more news stories on an almost weekly basis. Second, the amount of plastic that is continuing to accumulate in the ocean may amount to 8 million metric tons just for this year, 2018. And since the appearance of plastic in the, in the seas, the problem continues to grow exponentially. What do we do with all the plastic? A plastic wrapper, your vegetables that may have come in, that hasn't yet gotten to the ocean. If we bury it, it likely eventually <coughs> finds its way back to the ocean, <clears throat> as much of the plastic does, from landfills, down rivers, and out to the sea. Can we make huge plastic cannonballs and shoot them into the sun? <laughs> Don't laugh. I thought this a possibility. I'm told nylon fishing line appears to make excellent rebar for coral reefs. Maybe we should be building plastic cities as our own coral reefs of humankind. Now that was a joke. <laughs> um, recycling, reusing, and in this case reclaiming, as laudable as that sounds, seems only to delay the inevitable. But this is the big push at the moment. Now it takes everybody and more machines. The third problem springs from the second. It would be great if a major cleanup cleared up the obvious and a comprehensive reuse program slowed down the process of plastic lost to the environment by 50%. That's a big number. But soon, we would be back to current conditions. Well, OK, maybe plastic can be reused, and maybe re-reused, and then re-reused. How many times can that work? 
Think of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. At what point is that no longer viable? Depending on its classification, plastic can generally be used two to three times before it gets downcycled to, or made into a more useless or lesser value plastic. After five to seven times, the plastic microfibers are simply too short for anything. Now, it will take an evolution of being human. It takes political, social, and personal will to stop using man-made plastics. Or a new super science to invent a process whereby flat plastic is completely eliminated after use without getting into or harming our life-sustaining ecosystems. The solution may force us to no longer make man-made plastic, which is made, of course, from products like crude oil. This third problem will be fought over by practically every industry, not just the oil industry, and every nation, starving and rich, for the next hundred years, if we survive that long from the plastic not dealt with. What industry is not touched by a lifestyle-enhancing feel of plastic? Of course, we have other calamities that ironically may mitigate the plastic problem in the manner hinted at before when I say that some sort of partial or full extinction event will rid the planet of man-made problems. It appears that humans are not yet evolved, that individuals are capable of thinking and planning in such long time frames. Cannonballs shot into the sun <coughs> may sound reasonable. Unfortunately, it is the nature of how we homo sapiens deal with problems. Out of sight, out of mind. That is how the oceans got filled up with trash in the first place. Not being able to say this about ourselves, or hear it, or see it, is part of the third problem. Long-term thinking is what is required. As a human community, however, we have a really good chance. If we are lucky, we can buy ourselves some time by solving the first two problems, if we work collectively. This third problem is a wake-up call. We need to shake off the illusion of infinite use, most certainly, and maybe also long-term use of synthetic plastic. Furthermore, we have to find a way to pay for the consequences of our behavior that can be factored into the true value of things that does not cost us our lives. Why does a ballpoint pen with its various types of incorporated plastic cost so little when it costs so much downstream? We must create a new economics to measure this true value. Let's no longer worry about how we frame it, whether stating the obvious so baldly may paralyze some of us, push us into denial. We're past that. Fear motivates people, and this is a fearful sermon, but so does hope. I look to a reaction to this Congress that will generate a lot of ideas and paths to real action and hope. I'm not pessimistic. There are some really good ideas out there. For example, is it possible to count, to account from here on in the source, the country, and even the precise factory of every piece of plastic by using the pla nature of plastic itself? Using maybe a kind of forensic identification require the encoding of all plastic products with tiny parts per billion of unique alternative molecules or as tracers. That will help track down violators of international treaties. I believe working together we can change this threat to all of us as quickly as we created it. The doorbell is ringing. It is time to act. I'm very excited that my foundation is supporting this effort, that we, are, we see an, as an, a synergy of the best and brightest from differing perspectives to begin working together. There are, just within the past couple of years, so many NGOs out there dedicated to the ocean. It is time to coordinate our efforts to begin and benefit from the synergy of ecologists, chemists, economists, legal and political scientists, biologists, sociologists, diplomats. This is just the beginning. I think on complex issues like this, like plastic waste, and in places and spaces like the wide oceans where no country manages and corporate entities look at hungrily Philanthropists, NGOs, and foundations are perfect to lead the way. Let's get together and make it so. Now, I've raised a number of questions and ideas that can and should be debated. 
I know many of you also have questions that accompany arm in arm your concerns. I have been inquisitively gathering as much information as I can and seeing this as a multidimensional, multidisciplinary puzzle that needs to be assembled in order to address it. And so I have endeavored on behalf of the Wilsdorf Mettler Future Foundation to help create the broadest space possible for real experts to share and contextualize their expertise and findings. We look now to them who are here with us these four days to shed light forward to the next stage. And with that, I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Jennifer Brandon. Mm. Thank you for that, Igor. Um, welcome, everyone, to um, the second night of our um, PAGI panels. Tonight's going to be a little different than last night. There's not going to be um, plenary speakers. We're going to have um, seven experts come up here that are all working actively in this space um, to solve the plastics problem or um, to solve a little piece of the plastics problem. So I'm going to have each one of them come up here um, individually and introduce themselves, their organization, and how their organization is individually tackling a specific part of um, the plastics problem. So I'll have them each come up here. We have given them five minutes to introduce themselves um, because there's so many of them. And then when that's done, they'll all stand up here and we'll have a moderated discussion um, about the, the state of solutions as they are now. So bear with me because I've got a few PowerPoints open when I close this slide. Do, do, do. Okay, first up, this is what it found. So this is the one we're going with. All right. Drawing straws. And draw, truly drawing straws, but not plastic straws. <laughs> All right. So first up, we have um, Sherry Lippiet, who has been wonderful both um, is going to be on the panel and then has been wonderful actually in the closed room and working group um, all day, bearing with my um, terrible drawings on the whiteboard. Um, so she works for the NOAA Office of Marine Debris. All right. Thanks, Jenny. For the record, I think your drawings are beautiful. Oh, so. thank you. <laughs> Too kind. Um, I'm Sherry Lippiat. I'm the California Regional Coordinator for the NOAA Marine Debris Program. And our program was created in 2006 uh, by the Marine Debris Act, and we were designated as the federal lead for addressing this issue. Um, our mission is to investigate and prevent the adverse impacts of marine debris. So as the California Regional Coordinator, I have the pleasure of working with various stakeholders and partners in the region to identify and address local debris issues. Um, and so it's important to point out that we are a non-regulatory part of NOAA and have no enforcement authority. Um, so the work that we do is primarily focused on prevention, research, and removal. So I'll just very briefly touch on each of those. So first and foremost, prevention. Uh, so we have a grant program that, that focuses on behavior change. So trying to get beyond just raising awareness and education and actually targeting specific debris generating behaviors. Um, so some of our grantees work with K through 12 organizations and uh, one example in, up in the Salinas River Valley is the One Cool Earth pro program that worked last year with 17 different elementary schools and had the students uh, do trash audits of all the trash generated at the school and then develop specific um, waste reduction, recycling and composting programs. We also have projects that work with industry. Um, so one example is the Clean Water Fund's Rethink Disposable Project, uh, which works up in the Bay Area and uh, works with food businesses that have both dine-in and carry-out uh, facilities and kind of identifies all of the single-use disposable plastics or other items that are being used, makes recommendations for switching over to, to durable items, and then tracks the cost savings over time. And so they've developed really good case studies for businesses showing that it doesn't just make good sense from a sustainability standpoint, but it also makes good economic sense. 
Um, one final example, a project that we're excited to just have just gotten off the ground with Surfrider uh, up in San Francisco, supporting their uh, Hold On To Your Butt campaign, which is focused on reducing cigarette butt litter. Uh, so the second tactic is research. Uh, to help us better understand the impacts of this issue and developed, uh, develop more effective strategies to address it. Um, so we have an, a, a research portfolio that includes a shoreline monitoring citizen science program, the Marine Debris Monitoring and Assessment Project, uh, which helps us collect data on larger debris items that are in the environment. Um, we also have a research grant program. Um, some of the grantees are here today. Um, and there's a grant opportunity open now um, that's focused on risk assessment um, and exposure studies, fate and transport of debris, as well as assessing the, the benefits um, to habitats from debris removal. And then lastly, uh, removal. So recognizing that a significant amount of this stuff is escaping into the environment, uh, this is kind of a last ditch effort to, to remove it. Um, so our removal grant program focuses on medium to large scale accumulations of debris that are, that are having impacts on NOAA trust resources. Um, so one local example that some of you might be familiar with is down at the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, so the Tijuana River, the majority of the watershed is located in Mexico and a significant amount of plastics and trash and tires and other debris washes down, um, crosses the U.S. border, and is, um, well, hopefully a significant amount of it is being captured in these sediment basins that they've constructed. So the, the basins are capturing a lot of sediment and trash. Here you can see trash accumulated behind this boom and catching it before it has a chance to impact the coastal salt marsh areas. Um, so that's really our program in a nutshell. Uh, but the, the true credit goes to the various partners and grantees um, that we have the pleasure of working with um, that are developing and implementing really innovative projects um, to address all aspects of this really multifaceted issue. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, she was also lucky because I forgot to start the five minute timer, but she stayed on time. Now I don't even know how to start this. So Kelly might also be lucky, let's see. Well, Kelly is next up by the lottery system um, and Kelly is a policy analyst for Californians Against Waste. Oh, and Stuart's, Stuart's not gonna let you get by without a timer. So here we go. All right, Kelly McBee. Thank you so much, Jenny. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly McBee. I work with Californians Against Waste. We are a Sacramento-based advocacy environmental nonprofit, um, and I'm excited to talk to you tonight. Um, so Californians Against Waste was founded 41 years ago. Um, we address issues through legislative engagement and regulatory engagement um, on the full spectrum of waste. Um, we've engaged on mattresses, tires, um, carpets, other types of waste specific issues. Um, uh, to promote recycling and composting, but in the last few years, we have had an increasing focus on plastics. We've always engaged in plastics to some degree, but really uh, becoming more aware of the plastic pollution problem. It's taken over an even larger part of our portfolio, and I am fortunate to get to focus on um, plastic pollution prevention in my work at CAW. Um, so tonight, I wanna talk about some of the strongest laws that California already has regulating plastic use and disposal. Um, um, and then go into some of the new laws um, that we have this year and talk about where we're going in the future. So our biggest successes um, is I think our bottle bill program, you guys are all familiar with their five or 10 cent deposit that you have on bottles. That was Californians Against Waste's first program. We were actually founded as a nonprofit to get that program here in California. Um, so we continue to monitor it um, and it's recycled 362 billion beverage containers um, since its inception and it is the most successful uh, beverage container recycling program in the country. Um, 
and this is just a small segment, by the way, of our successful laws to date, um, our law prohibiting the use of the term biodegradable on plastic products. This is important to prevent uh, greenwashing of products that are plastic. We don't want people thinking that plastic breaks down and that it actually breaks up into um, elements naturally found in the environment. Um, they don't want to be throwing it away. Um, our Prohibition on the use of plastic microbeads. Californians Against Waste sponsored this piece of legislation in 2015. Um, I know that says 2011. <laughs> it was 2015. And this law prohibits the use of small pieces of plastic in um, personal care products. Um, that is now federal law as well. Just a few months after California passed our law, um, uh, federal government did the same. Um, and then, our, of course, our California plastic bag ban. I like to say that California banned bags twice, once through the legislature, and then again uh, when California voters confirmed that they wanted the uh, bags to remain banned um, in the November 2016 uh, election year. Uh, so 2018, just in this last month, the governor has signed um, four bills that seek to address uh, plastic pollution even further. Californians Against Waste sponsored or supported all of these bills with a number of other nonprofits. You'll hear from Trent tonight. Surfrider had a big part in these as well. Um, the first is SB 1335. So this law will limit the use of non-recyclable and non-compostable food packaging um, at state agencies, so at the food service facilities, specifically at state agencies. So we're taking a first bite, looking at just state agencies first, and then hopefully that is a uh, policy that we can take to all restaurants in California. Um, the testing of drinking water for microplastics. Uh, this is a very exciting bill that in the next two years will require state water boards to develop a method for over the next four years, public water agencies will be testing their water to see if they have microplastics there um, and then publicly disclosing the results. Um, the SB 1263 also brings another point into you know, uh, this bill will require the OTC to draft a strategy over the next few years for tackling microplastics. Um, and that strategy will be presented um, to the legislature so they can take action further. Um, and then our Straws Upon Request legislation by Assembly Majority Leader Ian Calderon um, starting January 1st of 2019, all shut down restaurants in California will need to request um, or will need to ask the customer if they want a straw before giving them away. Um, so this is, I want to point out, the statistics are great, this is progress in California, but this was less than a third, I think, of the full portfolio that California Against Waste worked on this year of plastic pollution spills. So there's a lot more to go. Um, and in closing, this is my last slide, I want to talk about where we think we're going. So when Governor Jerry Brown signed AB 1884, that was a straw upon request piece of legislation, he left a very strong finding message with the specific liquid in it, which he said is plastic in all forms. Straws, bottles, packaging, bags, et cetera, are all approaching our planet. Oh, there you go. Sorry, Governor Brown. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we must find ways to reduce and eventually eliminate single-use plastic so he has left us with this great legacy for moving forward and Californians Against Waste um, really wants to see California tackle plastic pollution in a more comprehensive way. Some of the things we're talking about with our allies now are potentially looking at a cap on the production, um, sale, use of plastic um, or a plastic tax. How do we really look at this as a broader issue? Um, and so those are the conversations we'll be having in the years to come. Um, that's my contact information. We're always looking for ideas and for collaboration. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kelly. All right, now we're gonna talk to Alex Grabows Grabowski. Did I, I didn't even ask how to pronounce it, I'm sorry. Okay, perfect. From the World Wildlife Fund um, about their campaign, which is called No Plastic in Nature. And you also have to use this timer. There we go. I'll do my best. All right. Okay, thanks everyone for having me today. I'm Alex Grabowski from the World Wildlife Fund, and I lead our work on packaging and materials, and that includes plastics. So, I wanted to start by talking about why WWF cares about this issue and why we're committing resources to it. So, our mission at WWF is to protect uh, the world's wildlife and conserve our natural resources. And we work in these six focus areas that you can see up here. 
and you'll notice that one of them is actually, the plastic is not up there, right? So why are we working on this, on this issue? And it's because we see plastic pollution can threaten our progress on these goals that we have. And uh, we also see that we need to take a whole planet perspective as we work on this issue. Because we want to stop the flow of plastic into nature, we want it to stop impacting our wildlife, we want it to stop impacting our oceans and polluting our rivers, but we also want to do it in a way that it doesn't cause another environmental crisis. We don't want the solution we put in place to cause more deforestation. We don't want it to cause climate trade-offs, and we don't want it to cause more food waste. Because this is not the only environmental crisis that we face, and we cannot afford to trade this one for another one. So this is our vision. Stop the flow of plastic into nature by 2030. It's a simple vision, but a bold one. And the reason we've written it like this is because we wanted to leave room for innovation. We noticed that we really needed to uh, set a vision that said what we really wanted to happen, but not be prescriptive about how we get there. Because there's only one thing that's certain in this space, and that's that we're going to need a whole lot of innovation to get to the future that we imagine. And we also can't afford to set our path too narrow in the beginning, where we might end up dismissing or looking over a solution that we haven't even imagined yet. And this would be easy to do because this problem is complex and has a lot of pathways. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but what I did want to point out is that we are focusing, everything I'm going to talk about today is focusing on uh, prevention, stopping the flow of plastic. It's not talking about cleanup, and it's mostly talking about land-based sources, right, not ghost gear, which is also a big problem. And the reason we decided to focus on that was because we thought it was the most impactful place for us to intervene based on our strengths. So what is our plan? We have a three-pronged approach. Uh, resource Plastic, which is our platform for engaging business on this issue. That's what my team focuses on. Uh, plastic pl Pollution-Free Cities Program, which is our place-based work to work in the landscapes that matter most for this issue, and a campaign to amplify them both. And I wanted to talk first about our Plastic Pollution-Free Cities Program. Let me look at the timer. Okay, I'm good. Um, this is focused on helping communities overcome plastic pollution. And by doing this, by making a plan that doesn't just make it easy for communities to implement this themselves, but also makes it cost effective for them. It's really important. Um, and there's already pilot programs running for this, uh, for this program in some of the places where it, it really matters the most. Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Hong Kong. And um, Importantly, we think that it's really important to recognize different places need different solutions. There's not going to be one solution that's going to work everywhere. Because ultimately, we need to meet the needs of these communities so that they can own these programs and take them forward. That's the only way they're going to be successful because that's the only way we can keep them going long term and be sustained. So switching gears a bit to talk uh, about our business engagement program. Uh, this is focused on transforming our material system such that we stop plastic from going into nature, but we also recover more, reuse more, and are able to extend the life of our natural resources and ultimately demand less from our planet. And business leaders are already setting bold goals on this topic, but this is well outside their core capabilities, and there's no comprehensive and coordinated program right now that matches the scale of the problem for them to join. So that's why oh, they have really important influence points, right, as illustrated on the slide. They have control over a lot of things and then influence over the rest of the chain that we need to take action. But they really lack the ability to convene at the scale we need to make the kind of change that is systemic. So that's why we're creating an action platform to create not just the resources that we need to move the market, but also the collective influence power. And I'm running out of time. I just wanted to end with the, um, the, the kind of core concept behind our whole strategy, which is that we want to accelerate and amplify. We really don't want to duplicate what anyone else is doing because there is definitely enough work here for everyone. <laughs> And, but we do want to help create that critical mass, right? There's a ton of great work going on, and I think that um, our goal is to try and tie it all together and really make this into something where we have, we, we ultimately solve this problem, right? We don't want to just do good work. We want to ultimately get to the place we're going. So thank you.
Almost, so close. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Do, do, do. Where's my mouse? Is it back? <laughs> no. Oh, there, there it is. All right. This is an adventure, guys. I can't see it back here. Okay. There's my cluttered screen. Next is not this one. We're done with that. Done with that. And next up is Winnie. All right. Any minute. OK, great. Winnie Lau, oh, sorry, I didn't even introduce you. Um, Winnie Lau is a senior officer um, with the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you, Jenny. I'm really excited to be here to share with you about one of our newest initiatives at the Pew Charitable Trust, and that's our Preventing Ocean Plastics Project, a two-year endeavor um, that was approved by our board earlier this year, earlier this summer, actually, so even fre more fresh off the press. So for those of you who are less familiar with Pew, we are a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., with a mission to um, utilize a pragmatic, fact-based, and disciplined approach to addressing causes that contribute to the public good. And our work ranges from health to finance to the environment and to governance. And we work at multiple scales, at the local scale, the state scale, national and global scale. So about a year, about a year and a half ago, my group, the Environment International uh, Program um, Group at Pew, started looking at the plastics problem to see where we could contribute to providing solutions. And what we realized very quickly was that there were many groups already working on this issue. We didn't want to duplicate um, those efforts, just like uh, WWF, uh, as Alex said. Um, and as you'll hear, as you've already heard, and as you'll hear from all the other speakers about all those other efforts, what we wanted to figure out was where we could add value. And um, one of the uh, things that Pew strengths lies in is providing scientific data and policy analysis. And during the design phase of our work, we consulted many NGOs and many scientists. And what we decided where we can most add value is to develop a global roadmap um, and to disseminate it so that we can all use it to identify the economically and politically feasible solutions. And we, and our approach to this work is, um, has three strands. First is that we will conduct a global economic analysis to evaluate the costs and um, mitigation potential of various solutions for reducing plastic flow into the ocean. Second, we will be conducting a, um, a regulatory and voluntary market landscape analysis so that we can identify the social and politically feasible solutions. And third, we will bring together a group of experts that will, who will synthesize the findings from the economic and policy analysis and develop and create a roadmap to provide solutions for reaching, um, to, for reducing the flow of plastic into the ocean. So for the past three months, we've been working very closely with our partner, Systemic, which is a group based in London, to develop the framework and model for our economic analysis. And we're taking a cost curve and wedges approach, very similar to that taken by the, um, the, the folks working on the climate change issue to identify mitigation strategies. And what you can see from here is that we hope that from our analysis, we can identify those interventions um, that uh, are most cost effective and most efficient for solving our our plastic problem. 
and such as uh, reducing production and use, improving uh, recycling, and improving the waste management. In essence, we're going to look at the whole system, look at all the solutions across the entire system. And to complement this work, we will also be conducting a global policy analysis, which uh, will identify the existing policies, the policy gaps, the uh, lessons learned, and the best practices. So we believe that for the scale of the problem, we... <laughs> We believe that for the scale of the problem, that collaboration and cooperation are key. Um, and because of that, we are working with over a dozen experts to uh, advise us on the economic analysis. And um, we are also um, developing partnerships with different organizations to deepen our analysis, broaden our reach, and we are also looking to conduct um, many stakeholder meetings with our NGO colleagues, with uh, government, with industry, so that we can share our work and our approach and get feedback. And our goal is to make our work open source at the end of this so that our model, our analyses, will be freely open to everyone to use so that they can use it to identify their own solutions, their own set of solutions. We hope that this tool we will, become, um, will be used by people and will be able to help advance the solutions. This work is in the very early stages. We're really excited about it. And um, we look forward to being able to share with you our progress in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. All right. Let's see. Up next, we have. Do, 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 do. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> we have Chelsea, um, who is a supervising recycling specialist from um, our very own city of San Diego. Here we go. Good evening. Thank you, Jenny. Um, again, I am Chelsea Clacious. I am a super... Can you all see me? <laughs> okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I'm a supervising recycling specialist with the City of San Diego's Environmental Service Services Department. I specifically work in the Waste Reduction Division, um, and our section, the recycling section, oversees the city's waste reduction and solid waste diversion um, and efforts. This includes public education and outreach um, that focus on different elements within the solid waste industry. So the way in which um, we inform uh, the programs that we're going to be enforcing is data-driven. For example, um, waste characterization studies that we do. Um, this one was done in 2012 at our local Miramar landfill. Obviously, you can see the types of products that are still going into our landfill, and that helps to inform and drive the kinds of programs that we, um, that we develop. Um, organics is huge, construction demolition is huge, but plastic is still a, a, a big part. And unfortunately, I think one of the reasons that plastic number is small is because it sometimes doesn't end up at the landfill, right? Um, which is unfortunate. So that is one of the ways in which we do that. Also, um, like Kelly was mentioning, there's a lot of state legislation that comes down, right? And so when we have state legislation, a lot of times there's not a prescriptive approach as to how you do it. The state just says, hey, municipality, this is the law we've passed. Figure out how to get it done. And so we are um, a very... You know, I work for the city of San Diego, so we're working on the local scale, um, and we are kind of boots on the ground to try to figure out different ways to be able to um, create behavior change. Um, and, you know, municipalities, jurisdictions have taken different approaches um, 
uh, over the last few decades, especially since the bottle bill was passed, which was obviously banner legislation um, in the state of California in the recycling industry. But, um, you know, we're trying to, uh, which is what I really love about what this gathering space is, um, the more we can rely on different expertise, um, the better types of programs and enforcement can be developed. So, you know, consumer-based social marketing, that is something newer that our industry is now trying to use to create actual behavior change in the public sphere. And that's through behavioral science, right? Um, not just people in the trash industry. Um, so those are some of the things that we do. Um, because we're able to get this kind of data, it, will, it also allows us um, to create different sorts of plans. So because of, because of this, the information and data we gathered and found, that actually helped us go to the city council in 2015 to pass our zero waste plan. Um, and this is the hierarchy that we kind of look at. I think most of you know what zero waste is, but for those of you that don't, it's um, basically looking at our discards as resources. Um, and there's a hierarchy to it. So everyone knows reduce, reuse, recycle. We're trying to flip that paradigm on its head, focus on preventing waste, um, you know, and, and, and refusing waste. It's also then focused on reusing what we do have. Um, and I would also, you know, say in addition to reuse, there's also a repair element, right? So don't be so discard focused, figuring out, you know, there's lots of tinkerers and, and, um, and repairing items is kind of a burgeoning green um, industry as well. Um, Obviously, recycling is something that everyone looks to as a first step. We don't look at it as, as a first step. Um, uh, then there's recover, other value that would be things like you know composting, et cetera. And then obviously, the very last thing um, for uh, is is disposal. And so the city's zero waste plan is to divert 75% of our waste by 2020, 90% by 2035, and reach zero waste by 2040. In addition to our zero waste plan, it's also an element um, captured in the city's climate action plan that was also passed in 2015. <laughs> Um, and uh, even though they are independent plans, zero waste is one of the main pillars. Um, and like Alex was saying from WWF, we do not want to um, focus on solutions that create another crisis. Um, and so when we talk about zero waste, we want to talk about ways in which we can come up with solutions that is not also um, affecting our ability to reach our climate action goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, though you kind of cheated the timer. Great job. <laughs> All right, um, one last one on this computer, and then our final panelist has arrived from teaching on Upper Campus, so we've got the whole gamut here. Okay, let me see. I have to get this into, I have to get this into uh, full screen. Sorry, hold on one second. This is embarrassing, guys. Sorry. <laughs> I was doing it before. Uh, I think go to view. There we go. Uh, Full screen mode. There we go. Yeah. All right. This is Trent Hodges with Surfrider. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thanks, Scripps, for having us. This is uh, just an awesome panel, a uh, great group of experts to be with. Uh, again, my name is Trent Hodges, Plastic Pollution Manager for the Surfrider Foundation. Um, the Surfrider Foundation's mission is uh, the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean waves and beaches. So we're really an organization that focuses on the protection of our uh, special places, but also not forgetting to enjoy those places, because I'm sure all of us here are here because of a love for the ocean or some, something about the environment or the ocean that's brought us here to discuss this really pernicious problem. Um, our solution to plastic pollution really is source reduction, right? So stopping plastic pollution at the source and really disrupt, disrupting the plastic industry to make sure that all those single-use plastic disposable items that we're constantly putting out into our environment, we're really stopping it at the source. That's kind of our overall guiding um, mission. 
And so I really look at our work in kind of three different buckets. So we have our campaigns, which we run all over the country. So we are a grassroots network of 160 chapters and clubs in a bunch of schools. So mainly volunteer led. And so this is kind of the bread and butter of Surfrider. We have a bunch of really dedicated volunteers who are passionate about a place and then they work really hard to protect it, often on their own time, which is amazing. We have our education and outreach. So really, uh, oh, this didn't start, so this is not fair. Oh. <laughs> Extra two minutes, no, I'll stop. <laughs> uh, we have our education and outreach program, so that's really um, getting the message out about plastic pollution, engaging folks, trying to get the message beyond our social circles, um, and then engaging with business as well, because we also believe that business has a huge uh, part to play in solving this crisis. Um, so on the campaigns front, um, this is, like I mentioned, kind of what we are known for. So uh, all across the country, we are constantly um, starting new campaigns to fight plastic pollution. So whether that's a local plastic bag ban, a ban on plastic straws, polystyrene foam, finding ways to integrate more recycled content into products. Um, all of our chapters in some way are engaging in this type of work. And so this kind of makes us uh, who we are. And we really start at the local level, the grassroots level. And working with great organizations like California Against Waste, we kind of transfer that up to the state level and then hopefully at the federal level as well. So since 2006, since we've been working on plastic pollution, we have over 170 plastic pollution victories across the country, um, which really speaks to just the power of when communities come together to, to fight plastic pollution. So a little snapshot of just our activists and our volunteers on the ground. Um, this is Eva Holman with the San Francisco chapter, where they recently passed a uh, plastic straw ban. That's her on the steps of City Hall. Um, this is just a picture of our, the bag monster, which you find at many of our local events and at City, uh, city Hall meetings. Um, and this picture of beach cleanups. We do a lot of beach cleanups around the country, and really uh, we look at that as a way to engage the volunteers to get to that next step of, of source prevention and starting those campaigns. Um, we're here in San Diego, and San Diego has an awesome campaign going on right now called Fight the Foam. So, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so polystyrene foam, as many of you probably know, is a, a really harmful um, and really ubiquitous uh, piece of plastic in our environment. And so the San Diego chapter has started a campaign to ban polystyrene foam, um, as well as make sure that uh, plastic straws and plastic utensils are available only upon request. So hopefully on October 15th, if the city passes it, uh, there'll also be a polystyrene uh, foam ban here in the city of San Diego, which will be huge. So, um, And this is kind of a bit of our education and outreach work. So we develop um, different digital marketing assets to bring the message of plastic pollution to a greater audience. So um, these are just some examples of the type of work that we do. Um, and of course, across the country, all of our chapters are carrying out events much like tonight um, to raise awareness about plastic pollution and help drive uh, consumer behavior change as well. Um, and then I also mentioned that we are engaged uh, with businesses as well. So um, we look at our campaign work as kind of, um, you know, the boots on the ground kind of stick approach, but we also want to do the carrot approach of working with businesses to help them reduce their plastic use. And so we started a program called Ocean Friendly Restaurants, which actually was kind of born here in San Diego and now is transferred to our entire network. And uh, really this um, program has kind of taken off this last year because businesses, um, we have found, are really excited and interested uh, and to learn how they can reduce their impact. So by simply engaging our network, um, developing resources and assets to help businesses reduce their plastic use, um, uh, we look at that as a really successful approach as well. So these businesses essentially follow a criteria that's mainly based on reducing single-use plastics as well as some other sustainable measures. And so just this year, uh, 350 restaurants across the country have signed on to the program. And I think here in San Diego, there's like over 100 ocean-friendly restaurants you can find. Um, if you visit sandiego.surfrider.org, you can find where all those restaurants are. And those restaurants as well are educating their consumers um, about what they're doing to reduce plastic use. So it's kind of a win-win. So that's a broad overview of all of our plastic work. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the panel and discussing some more solutions with this great group, and thanks for having us. Awesome, thank you. All right, come on up. We're gonna quickly switch, oh. We're gonna quickly switch computers. That'll work. 
Do, 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 do. Only the most professional here at Script Oceanography. We're ready. Here we go. All right. What is this? That's for the clicker. Oh. You don't even need to use it. You can use that, though. I can't use it. Oh, perfect. It's not USB-C. All right. No. Okay. Then you're good. Thanks. Is that up? So well, how does the time work? Is this your first slide? Are you yeah. Oh, perfect. OK. Let's start this over. Since Trent is the only one who didn't go over time because it didn't start, we're now confused because it only is giving us 37 seconds. So we got to start it again. Well, it didn't really count because I didn't start Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Oh, boy. This is stressful. Here we go. All Five right. minutes. You're on. All right. So um, I'm an artist and architect, and I've been working on plastic pollution since about 2013 when a German foundation of all the countries, German, uh, decided to fund my project, which was born in Los Angeles. So I took this seat at the bottom of the ocean uh, when I first saw images of, uh, like this, a plastic chair six kilometers down in the Baltic area. And I was a student at UCLA at that time, uh, studying visual arts. And I decided to do more research on this subject because I just uh, didn't like the idea that of all the places in the world, uh, there's plastic pollution at the bottom of the oceans. Uh, my research took me to this image. Uh, this, is, um, uh, what, this is actually an image from uh, 1953 uh, from a lifestyle magazine uh, because we need magazines to tell us how to live our lives in style. And, um, it's amazing. Uh, this article states that by using disposable consumer items, primarily plastics, you can cut up to 40 hours on household chores, which you can then use uh, for better shopping experiences. And um, <laughs> I found this image also very exhilarating, exhilarating and telling because uh, I don't know if you can see, but there are three people in this image. There it's a what is it, a molecular family? No, atomic family. It's you know the simplest family unit. There is a child, and it's a daughter, and her face is obscured by a flying piece of plastics. Uh, what really encouraged me uh, to took this uh, really challenging and grim subject was Chris Jordan's work. Uh, when I saw this image, it really gave me goosebumps. Again, um, the ultimate fusion of nature and culture happening at the digestive tract of a lazy albatross. So I ask myself, if, uh, plastics is, uh, if ocean is full of plastics, and if oceans are where life started 3.8 billion years ago, what if life started now in today's oceans? in our contemporary primordial soup of plastics. I uh, met with scientists, amazing scientists. Uh, these are, uh, sorry, that's not the image. These are images from Linda Emerald Zettler's lab in uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, she's a microbiologist which uh, studies extreme life forms called extremophiles and her research took her to bacteria that emerged off of plastics that's in the ocean. So I was like, well, I, all I have to do is extrapolate from this and imagine different life forms that could possibly emerge in a plastic ocean. Uh, these are uh, insects, aquatic insects that emerged again in um, uh, the contemporary plastic ocean. I found papers uh, which claim that um, Due to microplastics, the overpositioning of aquatic insects has increased. It's more uh, possible for aquatic insects to use the open ocean as their habitat, which wasn't the case before. So I designed or thought about uh, uh, different varieties of uh, insects. I thought about a Pacific balloon turtle. Again, research took me to a paper which showed that um, if given the option between clear plastics and colored plastics, a hungry uh, turtle, marine turtle, will always, almost always opt for the colored one. And their most um, preferred meal is balloons. We do have this problem called the balloon pollution. So I thought about this creature um, 
which has an elastic back, inflatable, a survival advantage in the face of raising sea levels, and a fitness indicator. <laughs> then I read papers about uh, the contents of the, the stomach of marine birds, and I might be wrong with the numbers, or it might have increased, but about 27% was bottle caps. And I thought to myself, well, um, in nature, as we know it, uh, there's this correlation between an animal's diet and their uh, coloration. Like flamingos get their beautiful colors from the krill they eat. What if uh, these birds, after eons of evolution, start displaying corporate colors, um, <laughs> such as Pantone red, which is the uh, Coca-Cola red, Pantone 485C. Oh, no. Okay. I'll still 30 more seconds. Um, and then I thought about other birds like that displays um, the sunny blue, avian pink, and so on. <laughs> um, I'll just show these in very fast and not go into detail. Further research took me into the, um, sci uh, the science of uh, metabolizing plastics, which is very difficult, so I designed um, a sense organ that can detect plastics. I designed a stomaximus, which is a maximized stomach that can churn up to 17 different types of plastics from HDP, LDP, uh, PP, uh, acrylics, vinyl, and so on. All of these little vesicles contain bacteria that Linda Emerald Zettler found that can uh, target a specific type of plastics. And this is um, how I uh, show the artwork. This is the installation shot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you to our very impressive panel. Um, can we give them a round of applause? If the seven of you would like to come up here, we um, will begin the question and answer session. Let's see if we can just have this on in the background. What really impressed me about that, I think, is how many of you are already working together. One of the real purposes of tonight was to kind of introduce some of you um, to each other and kind of bring some nonprofits together to collaborate, but you guys beat us to it, so we're impressed by that. Um, all right, before I open this up to the public, I guess I'll start with um, a question or two to all of you. But um, first, are all their mics good? On? I do. Is it on? Yeah, yes. solutions. So do you guys want to go down and say maybe the the biggest challenge you guys are finding in the part of the solution that you guys are working on? Is that yeah. sure. to, to start us off? <laughs> Would I be first? <laughs> um, okay, hi everyone. Just again, my name is Kelly and I work with Californians Against Space, the environmental advocacy nonprofit. Um, our biggest challenge, so I'm a registered lobbyist, so I meet with legislators and policymakers all the time, and it's really easy for them not to vote or not to take action on anything that they're not confident about, if you think about that. Like, they don't want to necessarily blaze a bold trail and then be caught somewhere where there's like, why did you vote for that? That you know, wasn't very thought through or is going to cost a lot of money or is going to be really difficult to implement. They really want to know that they're voting for something concrete and something that people really want so that they can get reelected, right? So my biggest challenge is 
making sh sure that they think this is a problem. I say the words plastic pollution and they're like, what? Like, what is that? We have so many other problems going on. So when, they, when legislators hear from constituents and they know it's a problem, they have more confidence to vote for something that might not be concrete. I mean, part of legislation, I mean, we heard from Chelsea, she's like, the state passes us laws and we don't know what to do with them all the time. But we have to start somewhere and we need to take action now. And we're constantly saying we need to do something. So um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much time, <laughs> but thank you. So for the work that we're doing uh, at Pew, right now we're focusing on the economic analysis right now. And one of our biggest challenge is data, data availability. Because we are doing a global uh, analysis and what I, I didn't share more details with you and what we are trying to do is look at different um, geographies, because you can imagine solutions in one, one city, one country is gonna be different from um, that in another country, maybe developing countries versus developed countries, big cities versus rural areas, and finding data for all these different geographies around the entire world so that we can build a global analysis is a big challenge. Um, we are you know, working with different groups, trying to get data, and um, also trying to use modeling uh, techniques to try and fill some gaps. Um, we, we expect that once we get our model out and share it with the world, that it will continue to get better and better as all of you use it and input your data so that we can keep improving the model, keep improving the information so that we can generate better solutions. Um, I would say uh, for the, the NOAA Marine Debris Program, um, I didn't share the official definition of marine debris that was passed through legislation, um, but it's very broad and it covers everything from tiny pieces of microplastic to consumer debris, lost fishing gear, and abandoned and derelict vessels. Um, so just kind of given, you know, limited resources and kind of wanting to work across all of these issues and be able to, to support all of the partners that come to us with really great ideas, um, I think that that's the biggest challenge is, is you know, having to say no to some. So. Yeah, so I would say that um, from the approach of, of a municipality that is crafting programs and, and um, trying to create change at the, you know, citizenry level, one of the biggest challenges is crafting the right interventions that will drive true behavior change. Um, we can do a billboard campaign or we can make a deposit program or we can do a lot of different things, um, but it doesn't mean that, some, sometimes it doesn't mean that they have to actually do it. So um, for us, it's really learning about how to appropriately engage with San Diego citizens at their place of work, the places that they play, uh, like the beaches or parks, um, at their home, right? Like how do you drive behavior change when someone's standing at their kitchen sink and they can, no one is, you know, no one's looking at them, right? And so, um, and uh, striking a balance, right? We don't want to be doom and gloom, and we also don't want to be so, um, we don't want to do too much all at once because once people get overwhelmed, they're just like, never mind, I'm just, I'm, it's too much, and I can't make, a, I can't make the change, um, or I don't, I don't, my individual contribution isn't meaningful. So, so that is that is always something that we have to strike a balance and um, and create. Yeah, I was actually. This goes back to our discussion we were having yeah. in the briefing room. Um, you know, one of the things that I always kind of struggle with is the fact that even though we've made a lot of progress with um, policy and a lot of companies are taking leadership to reduce plastic pollution, um, we're still ramping up the production of plastic. Um, globally, and especially even in this country, um, the plastic industry has uh, invested $160 billion in new facilities to produce 
plastic for packaging, as, uh, which is the majority of uh, plastic. So I think that one thing that um, just that we struggle with is that through all this work, recognizing that this is, this is a huge industry that is continuing to produce uh, these synthetic polymers. And so we really have to focus on ways that we can change that market so that, um, so that we really disrupt that continual uh, level of production over time to where that starts going down. And so we're still on that trajectory of growth for plastic production, but I'm, I'm confident if we continue this, this work that we'll start to see that dip the other way. That's the real goal. Hi. Um, this is live, right? It's being recorded? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I have a lot to say about, <laughs> <laughs> about the challenge of uh, being an artist and making work uh, that is informed by science, uh, of the fruit of collaboration with science, scientists, and getting it to the art institutions and museums who have thousands of subscribers, members, and access to all the cultural channels. So I sometimes feel like they live on a different planet. They, they don't have these plastic problems. They, they don't have any ecological issues. We're still repeating the art of the 60s and 70s, which was um, you know, um, indicative of that ideology that brought us to today. And it's so hard uh, to to find uh, allies in the art world to show this kind of work or to organize exhibitions around these subject matters. For whatever reason, it's uncool. And for whatever reason, they uh, invite synthetic polymers in the museums, but as artworks. And it's not you know, a subject that we should be discussing. And it really pains me because uh, at the root of all these problems is culture. And how does culture change through cultural institutions? A museum, it comes from Latin. It, it's muse, museum, inspiration, education, information. So you go to a museum, you don't think about anything that's happening around the world. For a second, you look at, I don't know, Picasso or Monet or whoever is popular nowadays, a hipster artist, and then you leave. So that is the biggest problem. When I work with scientists, uh, I email them. If I send five emails, I get four responses when I email curators to show work or to you know, introduce new artists who work on these subjects, I get maybe one response. Great. Um, there's, there's really a lot of things I could choose <laughs> to talk about. Um, I think what I, what I will say is that there's a, there's a real um, tension right now, I think, in where we are with solutions to, to think big and think long term, but also start where you are, right? And where we are is that to, today conti we continue to dump about a, one dump truck's worth of plastic in the ocean every minute, right? And that is, um, there are some really basic changes that we can make that are not uh, you know, revolutionary that could help with that, um, but how can we keep that big vision and, and really start on, on solutions now? Um, and, and that kind of ties into why it's really difficult, I think, to coordinate in a way that makes everything add up into a strategy that's actually effective in the long term altogether. I think it's really hard because we have such um, different problems in different places, such different conditions in different places uh, to match all the work that we're doing and everyone else is doing up into this cohesive whole. Um, so... That's maybe a little esoteric, but that's the that's the thing that I worry about sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's one of the things that's really cool about this is that um, we have fine artists, to city employees, to like the charitable foundations, all of you here, and you're all working on very different parts of it. And I actually want to highlight a few people in the audience that um, while well, the Nature Conservancy is here and Fiona Davis from the Mineru Foundation are here, and these are other nonprofits that are like just getting their plastic. Um, Project started, and so there, this is a space that people are trying to find um, where they can work on it. And certainly, I don't think you're all trying to do the same thing, which I think is really neat. We can all learn from each other. Um, and whether that's like pure art activism and education, or whether that's like pure policy, it's really neat. All right, so we're going to take questions from the audience. There might. Okay, let's. Let's do this. <laughs> 
I didn't know I was gonna get to go first and be so loud. Um, I'll ask a really short question. Is this problem solvable under global capitalism? Very <laughs> tough. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. I think that uh, we truly have to look at, um, at how we are producing these products, right? And a lot of that is our consumer culture. So, you know, the, like I was mentioning earlier, production of single-use plastic, like that is driven a lot by this culture that we have and kind of a capitalist culture. So I think that, um, you know, there certainly is a lot of space for us to look inside and, and say, you know, what is the si kind of society we want to live in? Um, you know, and we're starting to have those uh, discussions about like what a zero waste society looks like, how is that different, um, how is that different politically. Um, so obviously a really huge question, but I, I do think that there does need to be kind of a, a, a huge kind of uh, shift in the way that we produce and use goods. So obviously capitalism has a lot to do with that. Thank you for asking that question because we ask ourselves that all the time and building off of what Trent said, I think we have to have a cultural shift in values. Uh, you know, what type of world do we want to live in? Are you going to value convenience more than you'll value a, a small, smaller trash bin that you've created in your house? Um, and so having that value narrative, I think, is important to have alongside all of the policy conversations that we're having. Thank you. Um, Fiona David from the Mindaroo Foundation. And yes, I am Australian, so I, I hope you can understand me. I'll speak slowly. Um, one thing that strikes me about this wonderful panel, uh, first of all, is I'd just like to acknowledge the great diversity of the Scripps panel, both tonight and last night. As a woman, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, secondly, one group that's not represented here is business. Mm -hmm. So we've heard about people working with business, but we don't have business here. One thing that strikes me about the human rights and sustainability movement with business over the last 10 or 20 years is when it succeeds, issues become what is called pre-competitive. Mm -hmm. Businesses for example, will not compete on who can lower profits by having the most slavery in their supply chains. Okay? No one, no reputable business wants slavery in their supply chains. How do we make plastics pre-competitive? Because when issues, are, when issues are able to be dealt with by business outside of a competitive environment, guess what? They collaborate. I'm wondering if anyone has any suggestions, lobbyists perhaps, what would, what, what would some incentives be that maybe governments could do to make this a, a pre-competitive issue for business? I, I think your question is also tied into the first question. How do we require businesses to take more responsibility for their products? And I think that starts, that starts with a value change among consumers. Um, they have to start asking businesses to take a greater responsibility. Um, and you have to make businesses compete with each other. It has to be cool, cooler for Coca-Cola to recycle more of their bottles than Pepsi. Um, but they, I think it's a, I think consumers asking for it and demanding that they only buy products where the manufacturer takes responsibility. They're either uh, using recycled content, so closing that gap. They're uh, using reusables before they're using disposables. Um, and they're you know, investing in clean energy and the whole spectrum of um, targeting, like we've been talking about, not just plastics, but um, environmental protection on the whole. Um, that, I think, is the most important. And then it, that is going to fuel the legislative and regulatory piece of that that's going to um, have the, uh, the backstop, uh, the, the stick, the, the reason that they have to do it. Can I add to that? Yeah. I think having this here 
<clears throat> is really important, right? Um, and if we're looking at the intersection between um, academics and politics and, and, and nonprofit work, right? You have a lot of people at the table. Um, a lot of times, in, uh, what I've seen is um, the funding of case studies, right? The funding of case studies. Showing the economic models as to why this works for business, right? Um, and that can be funded through academics or through charitable, you know, think tanks or, or, or you know, nonpartisan non think tanks. Um, there's a lot of information that can get gathered there um, and, and, and incubation that can happen. So a lot of times being able to show that it works is what is going to, with, you know, forward-thinking businesses. Uh, zero waste wasn't really a big idea, but when Toyota you know, went zero waste in all of their plants, um, it made people in that industry look at that industry. Um, uh, seeing similar things in, in, in organics and in food waste, you know. Um, there's this, it used, you know, there's this culture about uh, making sure that your plate looks like it's always full and overflowing, but when you can prove an economic model as to why you shouldn't be throwing that food, the, the, the economic model of, you know, a restaurant, think about how much money that restaurant is throwing away into a dumpster at the end of the night, right, with all this wasted food, how do you, how do you, how do you work backwards on that and showing, showing those kinds of case studies? And then we, you have the, um, so that's one thing, right? Being able to, to, to get the data and to do these reports and to, and to figure, figure out those case studies. And then you also have legislative, right? Um, at the state level and other, uh, other levels. It's sometimes um, you have that data, legislation comes down, and in a state like California, right, where people maybe want to do business, um, it's important. It's a big state. It's a huge, it's a huge economy. And um, sometimes when those things changes, even like fuel economy, you know, when fuel economy changes, um, uh, uh, industry kind of moves, moves in that direction. Um, and so I think it is fully going to have, it, it will have to be a multi-pronged approach and it's going to, it, it will require the best and the brightest in all of, all of the sectors. Mm -hmm. yeah. I could talk about this too. So um, that's actually, I, I agree with you that being pretty competitive is really important to make progress. And um, that's actually exactly the way we work with companies on this issue. I didn't talk about it uh, in my presentation uh, because we had to be laser focused. But um, uh, we actually also have another initiative that I lead called the Bioplastic Feedstock Alliance, where we work with companies on making bioplastics a sustainable choice for the future. And we're specifically focused on sourcing, right? Because just because it's bio doesn't mean it doesn't have impacts. So if that's going to be part of a sustainable future, we need to figure out how we're going to do that in a way that does actually deliver more environmental benefits. And in our group uh, is Coke and Pepsi, Danone and Unilever, and um, P&G, you know, and I think that not, not all companies want to work pre-competitively, but once they see that reputational risk they have of not doing it right, a lot of them do. And um, especially when you're talking about this issue, I think we have a real advantage, and that's that they know they can't do it alone. They know that they can't solve this problem on their own because they don't have control over the whole system. They need to come together to get leverage, and they need our leverage, too, if they're going to reach the goals they're already putting out there. And um, those are goals that we're holding them to, right? Um, so I think the biggest thing in getting to a pre-competitive space is that you have to be vigilant against greenwashing. Mm -hmm. can't, as long as you can't greenwash, they have to come <laughs> together. And a lot of them want to. Um, and there's definitely a difference between, um, we, we see a real difference in our work with, between people who are, are leaders in this space, businesses that are really trying to put their right foot forward, and then you have a kind of a second wave of, ones that don't want to be the first ones out the door, but they're willing to follow along, and then there's always bad actors, right? And another challenge we have is that it's, it's always easy to engage the leaders, to at least get them to the table. But a lot of the really bad impacts are not caused uh, necessarily by them, they're caused by, well, 
never mind. There's scales. But, um, but we need to move the middle and the bottom too, right? Um, and I think that's the, the second wave of the challenge is not just getting to a pre-competitive space, but how do we get everyone in the pre-competitive space? I would just add just real quickly, I think yeah. it's important also that we don't, um, we don't substitute one material for another. You know, I, I, I know that, mm -hmm. you know, speaking of greenwashing, I think it's important just to point out that bioplastics, there's a lot of confusion about what's there going is. on with the bioplastics. And yeah. so I think that, you know, fully to um, make sure the right incentives are built in, you know, more of an approach like extended producer responsibility. So making sure the companies uh, are responsible for the materials they put out instead of just um, exchanging one disposable plastic for another disposable item. So um, there's a lot of really good examples of uh, extended producer responsibility that are happening in Europe. Um, I think it would take a lot of political will to make it happen here in the US, but um, it's definitely a model to look at as well. Just adding on, on yours. I, I, I want to add one other thing. Uh, so we call it military industrial complex, right? But there is also cultural industrial complex. And um, I think this is a change that has to happen in every aspect of life. So I'm thinking these companies, okay, they don't follow the legislations, they don't have the incentive, but these companies are made up of people. They're families. If there's a boss, this boss might have a son or a daughter, right? I'm thinking about this, and the son might be watching Spider-Man, for instance. If Spider-Man refused to use plastic bottles, or if Wonder Woman dove in and saved a whale whose tail was cut off because of fishing, we would be looking at a very different world. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask on a personal note with everything that you've uh, uncovered and discovered and worked with and through with your work on plastics, if you didn't have any barriers on a, on a personal note, with all that you know, if there was a giant leap forward that you could take, what would it be? I can start. Yeah. Um, I think in many ways there's kind of this, um, you know, in, in talking to the public that maybe aren't as familiar with this issue, um, there's often kind of this preconceived notion that people will say, you know, I recycle, I don't litter, I'm not part of the problem, right? And so I think just by virtue of generating waste, we are all part of this issue. So I think the barrier that, that I would like to overcome is kind of making that, you know, conceptual leap in the minds of everybody on this planet. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say too, is that <laughs> I think um, I, I find it really frustrating when we have these conversations and people say, well, we just need to design the system so that we don't have to rely on people. Like, that's too hard. We can't, we can't train everyone in the world that they need to be part of the solution. And I find that really frustrating because there is no way to design people out, right? This is about people. And um, if we could just get over that and get to the part where we actually start working on that, that would be great. <laughs> If I didn't think there were any barriers and I could pass any piece of legislation I wanted to, and, and Californians Against Waste wants to think this way, because we think Governor Brown, like I mentioned, has kind of opened that door for us for the next administration to think really big, um, we would cap the amount of plastic that we're producing, and that would necessarily correspond with a change. I keep mentioning values in people, but we think of plastics, I think, as cheap and as clean and safe. And, and sometimes they are, right, in the appropriate uses, like for in a hospital setting. But we need to think about plastics way more upstream. The extraction of natural gas and oil, the processing into plastic, the shipping it elsewhere, all of the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with that, all of the communities around these extraction sites and uh, plastic production sites. Think about plastic as dirty, as contributing to global warming, as contributing to you know not just ocean plastic pollution, but all the way upstream. Um, and when you think about that, you would look at your plastic fork very differently. You would remember you know, where it came from, where it started from, and um, it would have a different value. It wouldn't be disposable anymore. You would think about it as something that has this big footprint, and so it, it isn't something that you can just toss and use really easily. And so a cap on plastics, I think, would 
necessitate that shift in value and we would say, of course we have to recycle this, of course we have to reuse this, of course we can't keep making this, but it's, it is a part of our society and let's use it responsibly, the way that we look at greenhouse gas emissions. I'd love to add to what my other co-panelists have said. Um, the other thing I think we need a big leap in is to getting the economics right. Mm -hmm. um, the economics are pretty skewed right now. Um, and if we can get it right, it won't solve all of our problems, but I think can, it can be a big part of the solution. Good night, I'm Enrique from WWF Mexico. So when listening this conversation, I'm concerned on how to apply all this knowledge in developing countries, where it's more difficult to reach the, the municipalities when we have poor waste management and, and when a small increase in the expenditure for a family will be very difficult for making some change. So if there are some examples or some ideas on how to tackle this problem in developing countries, I will appreciate it. That's a great question. Yeah. I can go first then. Um, yeah, I think this is a real challenge. And um, we see that it's really important to get uh, that, that economics right. Right, because it's um, it's really uh, a struggle for a lot of these countries to implement things. And when you think about the fact that most, pretty much all waste is managed at a municipal level, in a lot of places, up to 90% of the municipal budget actually goes to waste management. And but they're still not really containing the waste. Right, um, you still have a lot of leakage problems. So how can we make solutions where? Uh, they fit into what is capable there and what is needed there, right? How can we make it so that um, by having better, better systems, they actually make money or cost less money, um, make things such that they actually benefit people in a way that they tangibly understand until they want to own it and, and keep, keep going? I think that's really important. Um, yeah. I can go. This is, this is near and dear to my heart. I was actually a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala for a couple years, and um, I lived in a small coastal fishing village, and I was in that village um, about six years after they got electricity, and um, of course, like the coastline, um, unfortunately, that area with all these river systems was inundated with plastic, and also the village was inundated with plastic. Um, and I kept hearing from these fishermen that, you know, five, six years ago, none of those plastic items had been in the community. They really, all these um, companies came in and kind of set up shop and it just kind of dumped all of these products on them with no waste infrastructure to be able to manage the problem. So um, unfortunately, it's kind of a, a waste colonization, if you will, kind of all these products moving to these places that can't manage the waste. Um, so I think you know, one of the issues is that some of these single-use plastic items are just so cheap um, or free they're just used all the time for anything. So there's, there's just the, the economics are wrong, just like we were expressing earlier. So I think um, obviously we need to, now that those plastics are there, we need to find ways to build in incentives so that uh, folks can collect some of these um, plastics and, and um, recycle them, as well as find obviously uh, more efficient ways to, to, um, to collect and manage waste. Uh, I'm from Turkey and I just came back from Turkey actually two days ago. That's why I couldn't make it to the first day of this. Also, I got, and uh, the lira crashed over the summer. So uh, I'm very rich there right now when I go. But it's very bad for all the industries. And um, when I left about 15 years ago, we still had a lot of agriculture. We had silk uh, producers and manufacturers. Uh, we had textile industry, all of it is kind of gone now. We're importing food from uh, different countries. We're importing silk and cotton from China. And it really breaks my heart to see this because where I grew up, uh, it's really fertile soils. And this was a very, uh, I don't know, um, lucky thing for me to grow up in that environment. So I've been thinking about this and I think it's really Im imperative to remind these um, remind the people uh, the value, the true value of their own culture and to protect their cultural and geological niche and instead of looking up to the um, you know, developed countries uh, or the first world, 
just inventing their own future locally. So no globalism, no localism. I don't know how this sounds right now to the, to the rest of the group, but um, really focusing on what they have and their own resources. I would also say that in the region, um, there's been a lot of great cooperation binationally in the San Diego region between San Diego and Tijuana and the state of Baja, California. And um, uh, um, I know like for example, especially in the border region like the EPA for example, there are um, grants available for infrastructure development. I know that a couple of years ago there was some development of like municipal composting in, in, in Tijuana. Um, there's also some really cool stuff happening right now um, in Tijuana related to plastics. Um, but as it spans out from there, um, I know uh, for waste management, especially, you know, uh, Zero Waste International is trying to take off. Um, they're trying to uh, hold conferences all over. But I think there is a space for, um, you know, municipalities, for sister cities and jurisdictions to, and governments to come together to share best management practices and to work together um, to find solutions. Um, Unfortunately, you know, solutions aren't always mo monetary, right? Um, uh, but I think that um, there can at least be a, a, a knowledge-based sharing between, between, you know, what, I guess, what works. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I think also as a scientist in this space, it's very clear that trash doesn't follow our <coughs> geopolitical borders. Mm -hmm. So places that have a lot of trash in a big storm that's now our trash mm -hmm. in the gyre that's very clear that that trash is coming from multiple different countries and multiple different mismanaged ports and so um, it's it kind of matters that we're all in this together and that we're all working <coughs> using the knowledge of one place is, is <coughs> going to help the trash in other places because it doesn't really matter where it comes from it's all ending up in the same ocean and the same seafood and things like that. <coughs> Yeah, and just really quickly, um, I just want to echo, you know, how important this question is and uh, repeating something that Jenna Jambeck said at the panel last night, with any solutions that are proposed, you know, whether it's waste management or policy or, or anything, you have to consider the context and the culture in which they're, they're being proposed and, and there is no one size fits all. I'd like to add, um, I agree with what um, you said. Uh, in the design of our work, we recognize that there is no one size fits all. And um, I, I hope that when our work is shared with uh, all of you and the rest of the world, that you can take that and then use it to analyze your own situation to find the best set of solutions for you. Because different um, municipalities are different, different countries are different, and you do need to look at your own context. Um, but. We're designing our policy analysis now and are trying to look at how we can look at that such that it could um, let a manager at different levels look at what policies are out there and be able to say, okay, that applies to me, that doesn't apply to me, and, and hopefully when we have our work that it can really help you. Hi, my name is Sofia. I'm a journalist from Colombia, and the, the very first time I saw something really uh, shocked to me was uh, when I was living in the Amazon rainforest, I saw uh, a group of women lining up to trash their bags in, uh, in the river. I said, what are you guys doing? And they say, oh, we're putting the trash in the river. I said, but it's going down the stream. They say, oh, don't worry, you won't see later. Uh, <laughs> The same thought uh, came to my mind when I started looking at the way we buy things for Halloween, for example, for Christmas, for birthday parties. I'm not invited anymore to any birthday party of any friend of mine because I'm always, oh, the balloons, they're going to the ocean, oh, the plastic. They're like 
Sophia, relax, it's normal. I said, no, it's not. We are consuming. We are blaming politicians, we're blaming regulations, we're blaming packaging, but we are buying it. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to know what you guys think about Halloween and all this tradition. <laughs> 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 that I a little crazy. Yeah. And that, those traditions keep the cars outside the garages. We have too much trash in the garage. So that's a way to, to sometimes invite journalists, journalists to these forums and spread the word out. And as you said, uh, Spider-Man avoiding the, the plastic bottles and uh, Wonder Woman saving the turtle from the plastic in his mouth. So I want to know in the family level, what are we doing for this problem? Because it's, it's up to us. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll start. Um, a lot of people always say, like, you vote with your dollars, you know, um, which is true, right? Uh, um, you're going and you're, and you're buying something, you're expressing your values in a certain way. As it relates to holidays, um, it might sound a little bit silly, but one of the things that we do at the city is, um, especially around the holidays, we're trying to do a lot of messaging and we go on to different, you know, local stations and bring examples on how you can reduce waste around the holidays. So, you know, around Halloween, we talk about um, the ways in which you choose your costume or using a reusable bag for your, um, uh, for your treats um, and, and, and such. Uh, around Christmas time, it's very similar on different innovative ways that you can wrap gifts or reconsider the idea of gifts, right? And, and reimagine what that could be. So, um, and when we also share these things on social media, um, on ways you can be more zero waste around birthdays and different holidays throughout the year. It's actually the most um, engagement we get on social media. Anything that's related to um, zero waste ideas around holidays and such, it's always, the, it's always the posts that have the most likes, the most shares, the most comments, the most engagement. So people get excited about it and they wanna do it and I think it's ripe for that. It's just not universal. Chelsea, let me ask you this. Do you guys see an increase in the waste stream like the week after Christmas? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see, I have a polar recycling bin. Of yeah, so. yeah. Um, we, we also, <laughs> yes. Um, we also um, send out our so the annual mailer that we send out, it's called the curbsider, and it goes to single family homes in the city. Um, and it's mostly to provide your calendar of your collection dates for the next year. It comes out just before Christmas, so mid-December. But we're always, it also comes out, if you've, any of you have seen the what goes where, it's kind of, it tells you what can go into your blue bin, what can go to, into your black bin, if you either have a green bin or a potentially backyard composting. But we keep adding to it. So now we have a section on, you know, textiles and different things that can go to reuse or donation or, you know, different kinds of things that can go back to retailers. And so that always comes around that time. So we do see a lot more material going in the bins and look, I mean, it is going into the recycle bins, you know, mostly. Around that time is also when we get a lot of, um, you know, the styrofoam blocks because people are getting appliances for gifts or something like that. But a lot of wrapping paper, like a lot of wrapping paper. Um, We're working and on so that. we have, yeah, great. We actually have, if you look at my closet, you'll see um, every different type of bag I've ever received a gift in because I keep them to re-gift them. And I, I, we've, in my family, we very neatly refold tissue paper and reuse that tissue paper for a very long time. When I got married, my wife was like, you need to get rid of this. I said, no, this has its own place in my closet. 
and I'm going to use this forever. <laughs> you might all receive gifts in those reused bags. <laughs> Um, I just, I mean, I just add on really quickly, you know, I think culture hacking is kind of what the, the term that we use, right? So like making uh, reusable items and more of a uh, reuse kind of lifestyle cool again, right? So that's some of the messages that I was talking about in my presentation is, you know, trying to make that more mainstream. So, you know, so they're bringing your own bottle and your utensils and, um, and just thinking about ways you can minimize your own waste uh, in a really fun and effective way instead of just turning people off. Um, make it something that's, that's cool that attracts um, especially young people, obviously, that are going to inherit this earth. Uh, I, I just wanted to add that I never had Halloween. <laughs> not a, it's not sad. I was still perfectly fine not having Halloween until I was 28 or something. But um, it's just, again, I, I think it's very important to see how everyone else around the world is like celebrating their um, significant days and their weddings and you know their Noel or Christmas or whatever. It, um, again, back to the uh, Lifestyle magazine article from 1953, it only took uh, 65 years to come here. So that's how long a culture took to form. So, and we have all these, you know, examples around the world that live differently. So why is it so difficult to actually pick the ones that would uh, fix the situation faster? That's what I don't understand. And I have one thing about your water bottle, and I hope you don't hate me. <laughs> but this, you have to drink water, you have to drink. This is also something that uh, I guess American culture heard again and again, but in Europe, you go to a restaurant, and when I go with my American friends, they're like, they don't bring us water. I'm like, yeah, because Europeans don't drink that much water. They don't walk around with a water bottle like you guys do. So it's all these um, all habits. Yeah. <laughs> they drink beer. They get their beer. They can, you can drink beer for breakfast, and you'll be fine. Yeah, that's true. But it's, true. It's, it's all these cultural habits that we have, right? <laughs> I agree with you on the period. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this might be a bit of a change in the subject. Yeah. There's a lot of energy around single-use plastic. Yeah, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's, uh, it has to continue. And uh, it's easier to connect with consumers and like, policy makers. But I'm just wondering, uh, for example, in Hawaii, when you go on the beach, more than 95% of the debris comes from outside of the islands. Uh, and then uh, half of it, about 45% of it, belongs to the fishing industry. So there's a lot of fishing nets and ropes and buoys. And in a way, that's a lot. So I'm, I'm wondering what are the, the strategies for solving the problem of fishing industry items in the ocean? I know Noah works a bit on it, but I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit more about the, the other strategies from other organizations. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. So fishing gear is certainly. Oh yeah. If you couldn't hear that because we didn't get her the mic, um, she oh. she's asking about um, derelict fishing gear and fishing gear as part of the big puzzle of marine debris. Yeah. Um, definitely, lost fishing gear is a is a big component of the issue, and it's a, a type of debris that has really kind of obvious impacts on habitats and on marine life through entanglement. Um, and, uh, you know, I think no fisherman wants to lose their gear. Um, so there are a lot of efforts um, to engage fishermen in both cleanup, better tracking of gear. So there are new technologies, um, like this organization up in the Bay Area, Blue Ocean Gear, has developed a, a tracking device for um, crab traps, which basically alerts a fisherman when their crab trap moves out of its original set location. It's not economically feasible yet, but they have kind of proof of concept. Um, so there are strategies to kind of better equip the fishermen not to lose their gear um, through like tracking and, and gear redesign. Um, but just another example of um, engaging fishermen in cleanup with the Dungeness crab fishery off the coast of California. Um, there was a program um, supported by NOAA and, and other funding organizations where they were uh, uh, fishermen would go out at the end of the season and collect crab traps that were left 
in the environment and bring them back and because there are tags on crab traps, they could identify the original owner and then actually sell those traps back to that owner mm -hmm. at a price that's less than, um, than the, the cost of a new trap. And so that funding could go back into the program to help support more you know, days on the water cleaning up. Um, so certainly not, um, you know, not the only solution and not a perfect solution, um, but I, you know, I agree that it is a huge issue globally um, and you know, not just with kind of our, our trap and net fisheries, but we're seeing more and more aquaculture. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, that's an expanding, an expanding source of debris um, and one that you know, we also have to figure out strategies to address it. Yeah, if I can, if I could just add to that. I'm looking at my colleague from WF Mexico because he actually works on this quite a bit. Um, so maybe you guys can talk after. But um, yeah, I think it also the the challenge is really different around the world, right? Depending on the fishery that you're looking at and what the situation is. We were talking earlier today, and he was saying that a lot of the gear that they find that is um, abandoned is is from illegal activities, right? So obviously, a, a program like that is not going to like work in that exact situation. So it really you have to match your approach with the problem that is happening, and that can be really challenging, right? Because it's um, it's really difficult to have all these different approaches in all these different places to try and address the issue. Um, but it is really important because while it's not the majority of, of the plastic that's out there, it is pound for pound the most impactful for wildlife, right? It's designed to catch them, basically. So um, definitely really important, yeah. And I'm certainly no expert in this subject, but um, I would mention that we, we have chapters on every island in Hawaii, and this is something, I just went to the chapter conference, this is something they deal with on a daily basis, and I think this year they've removed 70,000 pounds of nets from the island of Kauai alone, which is just staggering to me, 70,000 pounds in a year, so it's, it's crazy. Um, but they, uh, they're starting to engage with a group that is called the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which I'm sure you know a little bit about, Sherry, and probably everybody here. Um, which is trying to bring together industry and academics and fishing and fishers um, to find solutions for global ghost gear. So whether that's net tagging or um, finding uh, end of life solutions, um, like the company Boreo makes uh, skateboards and other products out of um, end of life fishing nets from Chile. So um, there is a movement to, to, uh, to really address the, uh, the issue. All right. I'm an educator in Oceanside. I'm an educator in Oceanside, California, and I've had the opportunity in the last couple of years to work with fifth grade students. Um, they've done research on the marine debris issue, and they use the trash talk videos from oh, NOAA. Great. They're awesome. Um, but um, if I have the opportunity to show this archive to the students that I'll be working with this year, if you had one hopeful, Simple message uh, regarding the solution that they could have an impact with, and for us to hear that and be able to share that with them. Can I start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, we, <laughs> when I talk about behavior change, more times than not, um, we hear about uh, adults who have talked about their habits and learning habits of, you know, at least in recycling and like doing the right thing. Um, when they were in school, we've, we've gone out to parks, we've surveyed random people saying, do you know, you know, what goes into a recycling bin? Of course I did, I learned it in school. And um, I can't tell you how often uh, uh, we also hear from adults saying, I'm doing this because my kid came home and, mm. and taught this to me. And so, my big takeaway, especially for your students and for students, is that they could potentially be one of the single biggest changes. Um, we heard, uh, I mean, right, this thing about if a kid is look, watching Spider-Man do this thing, it's, it, is, it is such a game changer and we don't give kids enough credit, um, but what they're learning in school and if they're learning the, the, the proper messaging um, and, if, and if, 
it, you know, people are investing into that, um, it can make it can make some of the most um, uh, uh, important changes. So the, <laughs> the children are our future. They really are, yeah. but uh, they can make, it's not even that they have to wait till it's their future. They can make changes now um, because of how they influence their parents. Yeah, the kids really get it. They totally amaze me. You know, I think uh, a lot of the stuff we've seen this year with uh, straws, especially, a lot of that's driven by kids that have showed up at City Hall demanding that their local city council ban or, or you know, ask for a straws upon request policy. So I think it's totally amazing. In terms of, like, hopeful messaging, um, there's a, a leader in the ocean conservation world named Wallace J. Nichols, and he always mentions that it's not extremely helpful to always, because in these conversations we always say, oh, the ocean's got five trillion pieces of plastic in it, there's eight million tons every year. But we have to remember that it's not always so helpful just to say the ocean's full of plastic, because the ocean is still full of amazing, incredible, diverse life that we're still finding every single day, thanks to institutions like Scripps. And so I think, um, in terms of the hopeful messaging, just to remind kids about the beauty of the ocean and, and all of the secrets and mysteries that it still has, regardless of the impacts that we're having um, as, as a human species. So I, I think never forgetting uh, to kind of hook them with that initial love and wonder. Um, and, you know, I've been able to see so many kids in this space, and you can tell them these things, and they just get it immediately, and they start refusing plastic. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the most inspiring, I think, part of this work. So. Yeah, I think the, the first thing that came to mind for me when you asked that question is this meme I saw of Oscar the Grouch, and you know, he lives in a garbage can, and um, it says, the text says, it's called garbage can, not garbage can not, right? <laughs> and so it, it kind of is like uh, focusing on kind of that positive messaging, and I think with behavior change, um, you know, there's studies that show it's it's way more effective to give a positive message of, you know, Try to remember to bring your reusable water bottle, not mm -hmm. like, you shouldn't be using that mm -hmm. plastic bottle. Um, and so kind of focusing, focusing on the positive, like mm -hmm. Trent said. Yep. I think I'd like, to, uh, thank you for caring about this issue. Thank you for telling your students about it. Um, Earlier I was mentioning that my biggest challenge, Jenny asked us, and I said my biggest challenge is convincing legislators that this is a problem and then inspiring them and supporting them to uh, vote yes on change. Um, I think a hopeful message for your students is that they will be able to engage in this issue no matter what they choose to do with their life and that their individual choices and decisions and the conversations that they have will matter and that they will be that elected official that I'm trying to lobby one day. They will be um, managing a corporation that gets to make design choices about their packaging. They will be at a local government um, getting to shape the way that they respond to this crisis and that is very powerful and no matter what they choose to do if they go into it with a mindset of plastic is something that needs to be addressed um, they'll be able to make change oh hi I, I really like that uh, you're working with uh, these uh, younger people I personally think that the most precious substance in the world is a young developing brain and they have it, and uh, they don't have to be a part of the past, and they can build their uh, own future. All right, well. <laughs>